Thank you very much. It's nice to see that the horn section of the praise team is, praise band is growing. Good to have a Lexus daughter, Alicia, uh, laying the horn this morning. If you have an instrument uh, that's not rusty, <laughs> now you can be rusty, but just not the instrument, all right? Uh, and if you're rusty, then you can knock the rust off of you and uh, let Linda know, and she'll let you know when practices are. That, that's Linda. There you go. <laughs> All right, give her a hand for all of her hard work that she does. And every time there's another person that's added with a different instrument totally, then she has to do stuff to get that music ready and all that, see, so. But uh, it's all good, so there you go. You heard it straight here, and uh, we're thankful for all the different folks who use their gifts and talents, some on the platform and some outside. Um, you know, we, it takes a lot of different, a lot of different people using their, uh, abilities and energy to uh, keep a church going, and not just financially, but uh, physically. And lots of work that's done. I, I'm thankful for all the people who work on the property and do cleaning and do office work and do lawn mowing. And you know, this year with all the rain, the lawns just kept on coming. <laughs> Usually they have time off, you know, and uh, we're not sure if that's going to happen, but we're very grateful uh, for that. I, as I traveled as an evangelist, as you turn in your Bibles to Genesis 14, just let me tell you this. As I traveled as an evangelist uh, years ago, I saw many churches that were unable to reach people because um, the pastor had to do everything. I mean, he had to mow the grass. He had to run off the church bulletins. He had to just whatever, you know, clean the church. And he did it because, you know, Pastors are willing to do whatever you have to to get the job done. So, but the problem was he didn't have then adequate time to go on visitation and to study and do all those things. And so it was very, very difficult. So uh, I value highly all the folks who use their gifts and talents. Uh, and the biggest gift, you say, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. Well, I can tell you what it is, probably. If you don't know what it is, so that it's not you know, teaching, preaching, or mercy, or giving, or something like that, then it's probably the gift of helps, and that's a spiritual gift in the Bible, gift of helps or serving. And people who have that gift are always willing to work behind the scenes and do anything that's needed to get the job done for the ministry. So, you know, and, and that's the main gift that a lot of churches have, but the problem is that some people who have that gift don't realize that's a gift. They just say, well, I don't have any spiritual gifts. Well, it helps, okay? Serving, that's a spiritual gift, all right? And so I'm grateful for all the people who use all their varied gifts for the ministry to go forward. And I didn't name everybody this morning, and that's the danger, what I get into when I say start this way. But I do appreciate each one, and uh, we thank you. We're, we're working always to try to get more volunteers to do different things, and... Uh, if you are interested in some area and we're not doing it, then let me know, all right? And maybe that would be something the Lord would want you to do. Genesis 14, we're looking today at a subject that could be controversial, but it's really not, all right? So we're not going to make it controversial. It's about Abraham and his faith. Now, faith is never passive. Faith is always active, all right? And in Genesis chapter 14, we see Abraham's faith that both wars and worships. It both wars and worships. Uh, the big idea, the big idea, winning faith, both wars and worships. Say that with me out loud. Winning faith, both wars and worships. You say, I don't understand it. Well, I, it's fine. I'll explain it to you in a second. Let's say it again. Winning faith, both wars and worships. You see, in the Bible, it talks about spiritual warfare, all right? Now, we're going to see in Abraham physical warfare this morning, but you may not be involved in physical warfare, but everybody who is a Christian who prays, you are, whether you know it or not, involved in spiritual warfare. So it's important you understand that that's an aspect of your faith life, okay? So it worships, but it also battles. So let's just jump right into chapter 14, because there's a lot here uh, in what happens with Abraham and Lot. Now, 
as you know, Abraham, as a gracious uncle to Lot, gave his nephew the choice of what land that he wanted to have because it was too small where they were at for both of them with all their herds and flocks and everything. And so Lot chose this one area and Abraham then took what was the other area. Now notice what happens to Lot. At the end of chapter 13, it says Abram, Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the oak trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. You'll often see in the book of Genesis here, Abraham in a tent and with an altar. He built an altar, and the altar was public. And that altar in that day, they didn't have church buildings. They didn't have synagogues. They didn't have, you know, public places of worship. So people worshiped at altars that were outside. And what I'm getting at is it was a public worship. So Abraham was not ashamed of his faith in God, and everywhere he went, he would both pitch his tent and build an altar and worship God. Now, we don't read that about Lot, but it, we do read that there were some kings that got into a battle, and let me just give you the backstory story uh, to what happens here in the first couple of verses. There of chapter 14, without reading the names of all those kings. The, the five city-states, and, and every city-state back then had a, a king. So there were five city-states in the plain of Jordan where Lot lived. And they were subject for 12 years to the kings of the four eastern city-states. And that's, those guys are mentioned in verse 1. And they were forced to pay tribute to the conquering kings for all those years. So they finally got tired of that and they rebelled. Of course, when one group of kings stops paying money to another group of kings, they don't like it. And so that was like a declaration of war. So here we, we see a little bit, uh, and you can just peruse that for yourself. What happened was they decided that they didn't like that. So the four kings invaded the plain of Jordan to bring those five kings back, you know, into submission. Today, this invasion would be like a minor skir skirmish, and that day it was like a major international conflict. Now, here's what happened. They got in this battle, and as a consequence of the battle, the army of the city of the plains, that's where Lot was, was defeated, even though it was four kings against five kings. And apparently the five kings didn't even know their land very well because look down at verse 10. And, and verses 8 and 9 set up the battle. You have the five kings there from the, the Jordan uh, plain, and they're, the four kings are listed in verse 9, four kings against five. And the Bible says in verse 10, the valley there was full of asphalt pits. And some of the people got stuck in the pits. And they, they just lost. They lost miserably. And, and all their army could do was flee for the hills. And in the course of all of that, they captured Lot. The Bible says, in, and this is in verses 11 and 12, then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. And they also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and they departed. So Lot's captured. Lot's taken away. And Abraham gets the news in verse 13. One who had escaped came and told Abraham the Hebrew. That's the first time you have that word in the Bible. For he dwelt by the oak trees of Mamre. And then they name a couple other people who Abraham, they were sheiks in that day who Abraham had made allies with. They were allies with Abraham. So Abraham was, was influential and had made some allies. And the Bible says in verse 14, when Abraham heard that his, and it says brother here, it's talking about him as a spiritual brother because he was his nephew. Taken captive, he Armed, now watch this. Here, here's the warfare. Abraham armed 300 
and 18 trained servants who were born in his house and went in pursuit of Lot. Now, some, some people, as they read this, they say, well, I wonder why God let that happen to Lot. Well, there may be a couple reasons. And I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Maybe it was because Lot had moved towards Sodom, and now he was living in Sodom. We know that from chapter 14, verse 12. And we wonder about that because Sodom was a very wicked city. We'll, we'll see more about that when we get into chapters 18 and 19. So what went on with Lot? Why was he different from Abraham? Well, while he was in Egypt with Abraham, Lot had gotten a taste of the world of the, quote, good life and enjoyed it. And like I said, Scripture never records that Lot built an altar and worshiped the Lord like his uncle Abraham did. The Bible tells us in James 2.23 that Abraham was the friend of God, but it, Lot was the friend of the world. So in time, Lot conformed to the world, and when Sodom lost the war, Lot was condemned with the world. Lot's capture might have been God's way of reminding him that he had no business living in Sodom. No doubt Abraham was praying faithfully for his nephew. He might separate himself from the world, start living like a true stranger and pilgrim. And you say, well, why would God discipline his children? Well, he does it because he loves them. He wants the best for them. God loves you and me enough to discipline us when we need it. We know that from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. We know it from Hebrews, too, where we're told not to faint because of the Lord's discipline, because he loves us. It's like my father used to spank me. And now little children, uh, this was back in the day when that was allowed, okay? So it, it was all right. But he always would say this. He'd say, now, Billy, I know you're not going to understand this. But this is going to hurt me a whole lot more to hurt you than pal, see? He let me have it. Some of you can identify with that, right? Anybody else get spankings here? Anybody else? Yeah. You survived, didn't you? Amazing. We won't go, I won't go far down that rabbit trail, all right? But now as an adult, I understand what my father meant, see? It was difficult. Sometimes it would be a lot easier just to let kids get away with it, see? But if a parent really loves their child, they, they won't do that because they know that if they keep on getting away with it, eventually there's going to be more trouble. So there has to be some kind of consequences. And maybe today, maybe spanking doesn't work. And by the way, we had several sons, okay, and, and spanking would work on one and not work on the other, all right? Because every child is different. They're all different. They're all unique. So I'm not telling you how to discipline. I'm just saying find a way that works if you have young children and do something to show you love them, okay? Because if you don't, they will think you don't love them and you just let them, you know, run, do whatever they want to do. And God loved Abraham and Lot and God wanted to try to get Lot's attention. Now, Abraham did not get involved in this war. He was smart, okay? You've got to pick your battles in all areas of life. He didn't get involved in the war until he heard that Lot had been captured. And when, when, when he heard that his nephew Lot was captured, then he acted. And he put together this army, 318 trained soldiers. The Bible calls them servants that were right there in his own household. And he went after Lot. And it's interesting about this alliance. Abraham was separated to God, but he wasn't isolated. He was independent, but he wasn't indifferent. And we, we know that because he had formed an alliance with several of these local sheikhs for just such emergencies. He was he, Abram the Hebrew, which means the outsider, the person with no secure place in society here. But he wasn't Abraham the hard-hearted, see. He loved his nephew. And he showed that when he gave him the first choice of the land. And also when he risked his life to rescue him. And 
Think about this. Lot had not been kind to Abraham. Abraham had every excuse to let his nephew suffer the painful consequences of his own stupid decisions. But Abraham practiced brotherly love and overcame evil with good. And family is family, isn't it? And Abraham didn't want to see his nephew Lot in captivity or worse. So Abraham and his allies chased the enemy for a hundred miles. They freed all the captives. They recovered the spoil. Now, I wonder if Abraham and his nephew had a long talk as they rode back. We don't know. We can't answer those questions. We're not told. But we do know this. Sadly, neither the Lord's chastening nor the Lord's goodness in rescuing Lot did him any real good because when he was left to go, he went right back to Sodom, didn't he? Right back. See, the Bible says in Romans 2, 4, that the goodness of God can lead men to repentance. And that should have led Lot to repentance, but instead of repenting, he didn't do that. He returned. Now, I mentioned spiritual warfare in my introduction to you, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today because we have the rest of the chapter to cover. But let me just give you a couple scripture references that talk about what your weapons are for spiritual warfare. And here's what we mean by spiritual warfare. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, that we're not in a battle, we're not wrestling in a battle, we're not fighting against physical enemies but against spiritual wickedness in high places. And the Bible calls them principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and rulers of this world. Now, most of you know about angels, right? So what you need to realize is this. There are God's angels, what we call good angels, but there are also what I'll call just to classify it for you, make it simple, bad angels, which are in the Bible called evil spirits or demons. That's real. That's real. And that's what the Bible's talking about in Ephesians 6, where it says we're not in a battle really against physical enemies, but against Satan and his forces. Now, you don't have to be afraid of that, but you have to have weapons, okay? So here's the deal. Here's, here's what the Bible says. In Ephesians 6, it lists the weapons of our warfare against these evil spirits, against Satan. And by the way, you say, well, what's Satan's, what's he trying to do? Is he trying to get people's souls? Well, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and a Christian, you have eternal life. So Satan cannot get your soul, okay? You have eternal life. How long does eternal last? Forever. All right, so he can't take your soul. But what he can try to do is he can try to hurt your effectiveness as a soldier of Jesus Christ. He can try to neutralize you, so to speak. Take you out of the battle so you're not able to help save any other souls from his kingdom. All right? And so that's his purpose in going after believers. Now, God doesn't leave us without weapons. And the weapons are listed in Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. And let me just share this with you. It's very simple. When you, you should read that later today. And you'll find this, that every single weapon that's there is either connected to the Bible. In fact, all the first ones are Scripture, okay? Like the shield of faith. How do you get more faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. So we want to build your faith. You read God's word more and understand it and then use it. Exercise your faith. Your faith grows stronger as you exercise it like a muscle. So our, our weapons for warfare against Satan are the Bible and prayer. Because the last verse, verse 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Years ago, a guy named Frank Peretti wrote two books, two novels, Piercing the Darkness and This Present Darkness. Anybody read them? They're excellent novels. They're novels, but they portray very, very accurately this spiritual warfare, especially the value of prayer against Satan and his armies. 
And in both of those novels, whenever God's people, the Christians in the story, whenever they were praying, Satan and his armies were defeated. Whenever they stopped praying and were fussing and feuding and arguing and bickering among themselves, like, you know, Christians are wont to do, just like everybody else, then the devil's armies won. They, they got the victory, okay? You say, well, how do you know victory? We're talking about success in spiritual battles. We're talking about whether people get saved, whether good things happen in God's work, or whether there's confusion. So God says, take the whole armor of God so you can stand against the wiles of the devil, because we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. And so take the whole armor, okay? And I've Preach sermons and series on that chapter. If you'd like to get those, if you let us know, we'll be glad to, to make CDs for you, make them available to you. So that's the spiritual warfare. By the way, you can't engage in that. You can't even get into that if, you don't, if you're not a, a soldier in the Lord's army. I'll talk about that as I close the message this morning. So Abraham rescued Lot from captivity. That was his warfare, okay? It was a physical warfare. He went after those kings, and he and his men, trained soldiers, defeated five kings. Now, let's go to the worship side of this thing. In number two in your outline is that Abraham worshipped God Most High. And by the way, if you will read a modern translation of the Bible, you'll, read, you'll see the, the, uh, the relevance of these places because in verse, verse 15, it says that he pursued them as far as over, which is north of Damascus, okay? So we're talking about Syria, right near Israel there. And then he brought back all the goods, also brought back his brother Lot. And in verse 17, and that, by the way, those verses let us know that the raid was a complete success. He regained all the goods stolen by the raiding party from Mesopotamia. And when he rescued his, when he returned, he was met by two kings, one from Sodom and one from Salem. And by the way, Salem is interesting because that's the, that's the shortened word, name for Jerusalem, okay? That, that city Salem became known as Jerusalem, okay? Jerusalem. Now, He's met by these two kings, and he first turns his attention to the king from Salem. And that king's name is a name that you wouldn't want to name your kids, I don't think. His name was Melchizedek. Can you imagine yelling that out down the street? Hey, Melchizedek, come in for supper. <laughs> but Melchizedek's name is, has an interesting meaning to it. It means my king is righteous. And here's an interesting little fact for you. Melchizedek was a contemporary of Abraham who also worshipped the living God. He worshipped the living God. That word Salem, as I told you, is an older, shorter name for Jerusalem. It's based on the root uh, we get our word shalom or peace from. And he came out to celebrate God's deliverance of Abraham and his troops. And the Bible says that he was not only a king, but he was the priest of God Most High. And the term for God that's used here expresses God's power over the nations. It's a Hebrew, El Elyon. Now, the great surprise about Melchizedek, and a lot of people ask questions about this, and I'll tell you as much as, we're, as, much as I know, and as much as the Bible tells us. Here's what we know from both Old and New Testaments. Melchizedek appears from nowhere without mention of parents or background, without any introduction of ties to the Lord. And so that mysterious quality of this man allows the writer of Hebrews to compare him with another priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that from Hebrews chapters 5 to 9. We also know it from Psalm 110.4. Now, when... Melchizedek pronounced a blessing on Abraham. He came under then the special provision of God's promise of blessing because in Genesis 12, 3, remember this? God had said to Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'll bless those who bless you. 
So here's the first one that, 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 was, that was true of. Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and God blessed Melchizedek. And when he says, blessed be Abraham, the words of the blessing are in two lines of poetry. You see them there in verses uh, 19 and 20. And they were more memorable as well as adding a sense of power and effectiveness. As I said, the phrase God most high is used in both lines of the blessing for special emphasis. And when it says possessor, it also may, means creator. Now, when we bless God, you say, how can I bless God? Well, Psalm 103, 1 says, bless the Lord, Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. You say, how do I do that? Well, when we do this, we acknowledge God as the source of all of our blessings. He's the source. Now, God can bless you through all kind of different human sources, but ultimately your source is God, not people. That's why if there would ever be a Great Depression in America, you should not get depressed. I know that sounds like oxymoron. Because God's your source, not Wall Street, right? Or not, quote, the economy. I have a question for you, if you know history at all. Were there any believers back in the Great Depression that happened years ago in this country? Yeah, there were. Did God take care of them? Absolutely. See, You know why? Because they trusted him. God's the source, not Wall Street, not your retirement, not your job. Now, it's good to have earthly sources, but God uses those earthly sources to supply. And if one source dries up, God can use another source, just like he did for the prophet there when the, when the stream dried up, remember? So notice what it says in verse 20 about Abraham. It says he gave him a tithe of all. He gave him a tithe of all. Now, let me just quickly spend a couple of minutes and share with you some facts about tithing. A lot of people say, well, I don't believe in tithing because tithing was under the law. Well, I have a question. Did, had God given the law yet here in Genesis 14? <laughs> no. That didn't come till later. It didn't come until the book of Exodus. So tithing was not under the law, just under the law. Tithing was before the law. You say, well, what's tithe mean? Well, the word tithe means a tenth. It means a tenth. And what we have here is we have Abraham giving to Melchizedek, king of righteousness, who is connected directly with Jesus Christ. In fact, some Bible scholars think this is a Christophany in the Old Testament. And I wouldn't go that far because we don't know. We're not told, all right? But... In the bread and wine that he gave Abraham, we see a reminder of Jesus' death for us on the cross. Now, what, what's this tithe thing all about? Well, here's the deal. And by the way, he didn't give it to the king of Sodom, only to Melchizedek. See? And as I said, the word tithe means 10%. So why do people give God 10% if they do? And by the way, let me be clear. You and I are not commanded that we have to tithe. I'm not preaching to you that you have to give God 10%, okay? I've never preached that. What I have preached is this. I have preached consistently all the years that I've been preaching that if they could give 10%, and by the way, they gave more than that because they gave several tithes and much more, okay? They, the Jews under the law. If they could tithe under law, and then we can do much more under grace. But I believe that if we're teaching boys and girls about giving, 10% is a good way to start teaching the children that you give a dime out of every dollar to God. It's not all yours. It's all his, in fact, right? Everything we have belongs to God, not just 10%. But when we acknowledge God's blessing as we give him the tithe, and the New Testament, you say, well, what about the New Testament? Well, that, that's very simple. The New Testament says that we ought to give as God has prospered us. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, on the first day of the week. Everybody, give as God's prospered you. Now, Luke six thirty eight says, give and it shall be given unto you. Let me share something with you. We don't give to get. In other words, you, you can't bribe God. 
Say, oh, I'm going to give God a bunch, so I get a bunch. He's not dumb, okay? So God sees our motive as well as what we give, all right? In fact, R.G. Letourneau, how many of you know who Letourneau was? He, yeah, he, he started a college, and uh, he was a businessman. In fact, he was, a, he was an amazing businessman. He, he started out giving 10% of all his profits to God from his business, and he ended up giving 90% of his profits to God. And he called his lawyers in one time, and he said, uh, hey, I need you guys to write up uh, documents for me so that God owns my business. And they said, oh, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, I'm a Christian businessman, and I, need to, I, need, I want to put down officially that God owns the business, not R.G. Letourneau. And he was the builder and designer of huge earth-moving machines, the first ones, monster machines, okay? Very successful. They said, well, we can't do that. He said, well, if you can, he said, I can just fire you and get some lawyers who can. They said, oh, we think we can find a way. <laughs> so, so they did. So he had to put down officially that God owned his business. And, and God blessed him phenomenally, see? Same thing's true, by the way, with the guy, uh, not the 90% thing, but the tithing thing with uh, Truett Cathy, who owned Chick-fil-A. They got started Chick-fil-A, okay? And these people all understood the principle, okay, that's what we're talking about, the principle that we honor God with our substance. And as I said, in the New Testament, we have teaching in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, also in the book of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, talks about the grace of giving. And here's a couple things about Abraham's giving, all right? Abraham gave to the Lord. He also gave promptly. And it's because that principle was firmly fixed in his heart. There was no reason to delay. He also was proportionate in his giving, a policy that Paul encourages in 1 Corinthians 16. He gave because he loved God. He wanted to acknowledge God's greatness and goodness. Now, that's a contrast between the Most High God and the heathen idols of the pagan countries around there. Abraham's God is possessor creator of heaven and earth. That's what Genesis 14, 19 says, also Isaiah 40. So he deserves all the worship and praise of all of his people. Before the battle, Abraham lifted his hand by faith in a solemn vow to God he would take nothing from the spoils. That's because he had a single heart and mind, Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters. During the battle, Abraham wielded his sword by faith and trusted God for victory. After the battle, by faith, Abraham closed his hands to the king of Sodom. See, king of Sodom comes along and he doesn't, Abraham doesn't respond to him. He says, I'll take nothing. From a thread to a sandal strap. I'll not take anything that's yours because I don't want anybody to say I made Abraham rich. So he said, just what the young men have eaten, let them take their portion. So Abraham recognized God. He opened his hands to the king of Salem, the king of peace, and received the bread and wine that he brought him and he gave tithes of all that he had. 1 John 5, 14 and 16 says this, This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. This is the victory that's overcome the world, our faith. We sing a great hymn, Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Now, I said I would talk to you about how you become a soldier as I close. Here it is. There's two kinds of faith mentioned in the Bible. There's saving faith, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you're not saved by your works, you're not saved by your good deeds, by keeping the Ten Commandments, by loving your neighbor, all that's good stuff to do, but that doesn't save your soul. Your soul is saved when you understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, you can't do anything to earn it or work for it or deserve it. You have to accept it freely as a gift. The Bible says the wages of our sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, once you're saved by faith, God keeps us, okay? You don't keep yourself saved. God keeps you. Paul said 
uh, now unto him who is able to keep me. Okay, I, I commit to him that which I have given against that day. He's able to keep what I've committed to him. So Paul trusted God to keep him saved. So you say, well, why do I need faith now? Well, you need faith now for spiritual warfare. The shield of faith. Okay, so here's my trust in. We, we, we walk by faith, not by sight. Here's the question. Can you see God? No, you can't see God. Can you see God's word? Yes. Do you have a choice whether you believe God's word or not? Yes, right? You do. You have a choice. So you can choose to believe God's word. Guess what? If you choose to believe it, it will be true for you. The promises. Okay? Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself also in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Many, many promises. There's 8,000 in the Bible. They'll be true for you, but only if you believe them and act upon them. It's kind of like a, a check, okay? I know that people don't do checks much anymore today, but if you were given a check by a rich uncle or somebody, okay, who wanted to bless you, and they gave you a check for $500, all right? And you just looked at the check and said, oh, my, this is, so, this is so wonderful. I have this $500. No, you don't. Not yet. You, don't have, you have a paper representation of it, correct? Can you spend just the paper? Can you spend the check? No, you don't spend the check. What do you have to do to make the check yours, to make the $500 yours. Well, the check's yours, but the 500 What do you have to do? You have to endorse it in some way, right? And that's the same thing without drawing that out too long, because now we, have, we, can, we can deposit checks electronically. I got all that, okay? You still got to write something on it. It still has to go to your account, okay? So God's, God's promises are all here. They're like checks, they're made out to you. If you want to receive them, you have to endorse the check. You have to, by faith, say, Father, thank you for this promise. I believe your word. I take you at your word. Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. That's a promise, right? So you can believe it or you can not believe it. It's your choice. But if you're a Christian soldier, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, and now you're in the Lord's army, and so you say, Father, General, Commander-in-Chief, tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. And guess what many of our orders come from right here? This book. It tells us to share our faith. It tells us to be faithful. It asks us to show the love of God to other people who don't know about it. You say, well, they don't all deserve it. Well, neither did I when God loved me. Say, did any of us deserve God's love? No. So he says, I want you to love others like I love you. And that's warfare. That's spiritual warfare. So your faith, if it wins, it will both not only worship, but it will war and do what God wants it to do. And God will bless you for it. Let's bow our heads for prayer, please. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, it's possible that everybody here this morning already has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, but I never assume that, okay? I don't ever want to presume that. And that's why every Sunday morning I invite people, if they have not yet accepted Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for themselves, and they've not made it personal, have not received Jesus Christ by saving faith, I invite them to do that. You can do so by praying this prayer silently from your heart of hearts to God's right now. Dear, dear Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I do believe he died for me, for my sins. I, ex I repent of my sins. I accept him now as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me your child. Give me eternal life. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving me. Help me now live my life for you. 
In Jesus' name I pray. With our heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer this morning for the very first time and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says whoever believes in him won't be ashamed. And so that one way you can show you're not ashamed is by just raising your hand right now. And by that raised hand, you're saying, yes, I prayed with you a moment ago to accept Christ as my Savior. Every one of us have to do it for ourselves, okay? Your husband, your wife, your friend, they can't do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. Your father, your mother can't do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. And you don't have to do it over and over. Everybody has to do it once, though, because eternal life lasts forever. All right, final question as we pray before we stand for the closing song. Christian friend, how's your faith walk? How's your faith walk? How's your spiritual warfare going? How's your worship of the Lord going? If God's Holy Spirit spoke to you as a believer in Christ this morning and you say, well, there's some things in my spiritual armor I need to add to it, I need to, I need to do with God's help. God's spoken to me. Perhaps it's that it's the shield of faith. Perhaps it's, it's your prayer life. Maybe you need to become a prayer warrior. I don't know what it is, but God does. And if you're here this morning and want me to pray for you as a Christian, just lift your hand right now. And you're, by that lift hand, you're saying, yes, I'm a believer in Christ, and God's Spirit spoke to me, and I want to be obedient. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Father, I thank you that you love us very much, that you're patient with us. You're long-suffering. We thank you for the examples in the Bible that you give us of Abraham and others who walked by faith, not by sight. Help us to walk in the same way. And even though we don't see you, we see your word and your promises and we can believe them if we make the right choice, if we choose to. We thank you that when we do, that you honor that choice and honor our faith. Bless those who raise their hand and help them to be able to walk by faith, not sight. If there's anyone here this morning that has a spiritual need, meet them at their point of need as they recognize and acknowledge it to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Stand please.